great job staying on his feet. And look at the downfield blocking by Adrian Claiborne here, allowing him to scamper into the end zone. It's a 24 to 13 bucks lead at that point. Tom Coughlin needs a hug. Tim, break down that INT. Trey, sometimes you need to give credit to the guys on the defensive side of the ball. Eli Manning, this Giants offense, doing exactly what they're coached to do here, and it leads into a bad play. The five offensive linemen, they're going to block the four known rushers and the Mike linebacker. The fullback is going to block the Will linebacker. So that means when you remove them from the equation, if the nickel Sam, Eric Wright in this case, blitzes, Eli has to throw the hot, which is to Victor Cruz right away, get the ball out of his hands. And so you're going to see what happens when this develops for Eli. Ball snap, here comes Eric Wright, ball out of his hands, but Wright reads it and makes an outstanding play on the football. You see there, there's the hot route by Victor Cruz. Eli's trying to get it to him before the safety can get there and before Eric Wright can get to him. But Eric Wright reads it, makes a huge play for that Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense. And really, you look at that, Eli doing what he was coached to do, but great play by the Tampa Bay Bucks defense, which ended a brutal first half of that Giants offense. But something tell me, tells me Eli's day got much better. Oh, Tim, you're prophetic. In the second half, specifically the fourth quarter. Let me put it this. Remember how great Eli was last year in the fourth quarter? Set a new record for the most touchdown passes. He's doing that again. This is an 80-yarder to Victor Cruz, who scampers into the end zone. Merrill, how did that happen? Well, listen, a lot of the changes for the Giants was in their protections. Now, they're going to slide the offensive line to the right because they're going to get a blitzer coming off there. Now, watch Rondé Barber. This is critical because he's understanding. Listen, I'm trusting the pressure's going to get there. Therefore, I can play the shorter route. Look at his feet. The sliding to the right takes care of that blitzer. So now, Eli has more time. Look at his footwork, sitting flat. Victor Cruz going vertical. Well, Rondé Barber's thinking that ball will come out quick, but because Eli has time, he can step up in the pocket. Way too much time. And it's not a prime Tim dime, but it was a dime. It, was a, it was a salsa also is what it was. Okay, uh, Giants go for two points, and just like that, what was a huge lead is tied up at 27 as Andre Brown gets in there. Next Giants possession, same score. Martellus Bennett, who made exactly zero of these kind of plays for the Dallas Cowboys there. A 33-yard touchdown. The Giants take a 34-27 lead. But wait, back come the Bucs. Uh, this one could have been a prime Tim dime. Freeman to Mike Williams, 41 yards, but we can't actually call it a prime Tim dime because we had a helping hand or a helping helmet. Have you ever seen this before? Stoink! Right off the helmet into his arm. Yeah, the catch was too good to make it the, the prime Tim dime, but still an outstanding play by that Bucks offense. Tied it up at 34. By the way, Eli Manning threw for 240 plus yards in the fourth quarter. In the fourth quarter! That's what Josh Freeman had for the entire game. Here he hits Akeem Nix for a big gain of 50. And later on that drive, it's Andre Brown again. Remember, Ahmad Bradshaw out of this game with a sprained neck. 41-34 Giants. That would be the final score. But the final play, the Giants take the victory formation. And in come the Bucs trying to get at the ball. The Giants say, what the heck are you guys doing there? And Eli's like, did that really just happen? And here's what Greg Schiano and Tom Coughlin were discussing after the game, that very last play, and the discussion continued after they both left the field. I, I don't think you do that at this level. You don't do that in this league. You don't, you don't jeopardize not only that, I mean, you jeopardize the offensive line, you jeopardize the quarterback. You know, that, that was, thank goodness we didn't get anybody hurt, that's all, that I know of. A couple of linemen were late coming in. I don't know if that's not something that's done in the, in the National Football League, but what I do with our football team is we fight until they tell us game over. Some people were upset about it. That's the way we play. Clean, hard football until they tell us the game's over. All right. Obviously, this has been a much debated point everywhere. <laughs> right or wrong, what happened at the end of that game? I mean, it wasn't illegal. Let's be clear. There's nothing in the rules. Right or wrong? Well, it definitely should not have been a penalty. I, I, here's what I would say. Is Tom, Tom Coughlin right to have that type of reaction? I think he is. You know, you look at a situation where you're kneeling down, you got three defensive players right over the center, and they hit the center at knee level, okay, and push that guy back into his quarterback. Uh, I understand what the Bucks are trying to do there, but Merrill, if the tight end were to fire off the ball and cut block the corner who's just outside to him, a melee. You shouldn't do it on the offensive side of the ball. 
And that's why Tom Coughlin has a right to be upset. Well, if I look from Tom Coughlin's perspective right now, you got to think if this is reversed, if the Tampa Bay Buccaneers had their quarterback or their offensive players in that vulnerable situation, I'm sure it would have been the, the feelings would have been different as far as this thing took place. But the thing that I look at is the Giants came out in a victory formation. In the National Football League, that is like, okay, we're done. We're not going to come off and hit, the, try to run the football and take one more play. We're done. We're just going to take a knee. I believe there was five seconds left on the clock. The only way the Bucks have a chance to do this is they have got to scoop that ball up and score. There's not enough time to um, win. Another it. miracle at the Meadowlands. Yes. Basically. So without them running a play, which the miracle in the Meadowlands was right. running they tried a to play, run a play. they, they tried fumbled to it, they right. picked it up. That wasn't going to happen in this. And this is a different environment than Rutgers, okay? Those are yeah. kids in college, okay? These are guys that have livelihoods, um, money on the line. Their livelihoods and their lives are at stake with that stuff. You don't have to do that on the last play. And I think, you know, Tim, you mentioned all the games we saw in the last seconds. Yeah. With the last, you know, there was one possession for them winning. What'd they do? Yeah, they took the. Listen, took that, the that kneel down, that victory formation in Meadowlands, very different than everywhere else around the league. Absolutely. And again, it's a really tough week for the Giants now because they got a short week. They play Thursday night. The good news is they can always have Eli Manning just chuck it for 500 yards. He set an NFL record last season with 15 fourth quarter touchdown passes. Sunday's fourth quarter performance against the Bucks off the charts. Again, threw for 243 yards in the fourth quarter. Averaged nearly 19 yards per attempt and posted a total QBR of 99.6. Disclaimer, QBR, the advanced metric that examines everything a quarterback does when he does it, is measured on a scale of 0 to 100. He was really closer to 100 than he was to 0. Then there was the interesting game, Battle of the Birds, between the Ravens and the Eagles. Michael Vick, of course, was a turnover fest week one on the road, came away with the win. Michael Vick at home, a turnover fest week two and still managed to come away with a win despite doing things like this interception by Bernard Pollard. Can't do it. Running to your right, trying to throw it back across the left side of the field. Bad decision by Vic. One of two picks by Vic. Second quarter, Joe Flacco to Jacoby Jones. This might have been the best dance all day. I mean, Victor Cruz is known for it. I, I, that was good. It was on. Ravens take the lead. Final minutes of the half. Eagles conservative inside their 10. LaShawn McCoy for three. Inability to run the ball situationally, Trey, gets the Eagles in trouble. You see it here, not able to extend the drive to run up the clock in the half when they have bad field position. And when you do that and you turn that football over, gives the Ravens an opportunity for points at the end of the half. You mean like this? When exactly. Justin Tucker drills a 56-yarder? So just like that, because of their inability to run it out, the Ravens take a 17-7 lead. This game was chipping, by the way. The entire, the entire game. Everybody on edge. Yes, Vic would lead the Eagles back. Rolling on third down, and oh, what a great play. Jeremy Macklin in the end zone, so now it's a three-point game. Fourth quarter, Ravens up by three. Flacco, Jacoby Jones, caught, but wait. The replacement reps rule offensive pass interference. Right call? Uh, no, this will probably be more defensive pass interference, because the one thing the defender has to do in a rule of thumb Play the ball, turn your head. That did not happen here. All right, Ravens settle for a field goal. Two minutes left, Eagles down 23 to 17. Michael Vick, go ahead, touchdown. Eagles take a 24 23 lead. This was after a very somewhat ridiculous fumble, incomplete pass rule there. But uh, uh, I don't know his farm could have went anymore. Forward. Exactly. <laughs> All right, and now the defense here. Uh, Merrill on a third quarter, Ravens facing a third and two. Well, they did a great job. The, as far as the Eagles go of getting pressure on third and two, adjust their down four. And these are critical downs. This is when you've got to get the ball back, and they did it time after time after time. In fact, what was most shocking about this is fourth and two, they do the same thing. I'm wondering if the Ravens, when they're done and this game was over, evaluate their play calling. You got Ray Rice, short yardies, maybe you ought to give him a crack at it. Every once in a while, they seem to forget that they have Ray Rice maybe. on that roster. As for the Eagles, hey, they won the game. Congratulations, but it's hardly been the greatest 2 0 start we've ever seen. In fact, they are now the first team in NFL history to win each of its first two games by a single point. Not only that, they're the first team since the 1983 Los Angeles Rams to start 2 0 with at least four turnovers in each game. You know, we always say the most telling stat you'll ever find when you analyze a box score from an NFL game is the turnovers. And the Eagles are flying literally in the face of that statistic through the first two weeks. How long can they keep this up? 
Well, I mean, if their defense keeps playing outstanding, they can survive it longer. But you can't sustain it, especially when you start to, you know, instead of playing, you know, Brandon Whedon and, and playing, uh, you know, a Ravens def defense, as Merrill said, that forgot about Ray Rice in some crucial situations. You're going to be dealing with Tony Romo. You're going to be dealing with Eli Manning. Uh, and I think that's a problem when you look at them going forward. Now, let's give Juan Castillo, the defensive coordinator, some credit for the way that defense is playing. Let's give that team some credit for rallying, even with all the adversity, but I don't think you can sustain it. Well, you can't sustain it playing like that. However, here's the bright light or the silver lining for the Philadelphia Eagles right now. You want to play your best football about end of November, into December. That's when you really want to get on a roll. Well, the Eagles are clearly not playing their best football, but they're winning games. So these type of games that you're winning, you turn things around, you start to play your good football around November, it's these games right here that propelled you to a possible playoff berth. And for the Eagles, I know it's about winning a Super Bowl and getting to a Super Bowl. But these are actually a good sign for the Philadelphia Eagles. If you can win these games, they're two in the bank you probably shouldn't have had. And, and along that point, by the way, hard to believe this is the first time the Eagles have started 2-0 since 2004. 1 0, by the way, they advanced oh. to Super Bowl 39 well, before they lost to the Patriots 24 to 21. Information off Merrill's analytical point. It all works together <laughs> on NFL Primetime. When we continue, how the West was won, once mocked. Is it now the best division in football, the NFC West? Plus, Peyton Manning and the AFC West Denver Broncos head to Atlanta to take on Matt Ryan on Monday night. What to expect? NFL Primetime is presented by Bud Light, the official beer sponsor of the NFL. Here we go. And in part by McDonald's. I'm loving it. And Hotel Transylvania in theaters September 28th. Thursday Night Baseball, live on ESPN America. The fight for the postseason is on. The A's can still clinch a spot in October, but Fairlander and the Tigers are hot on their heels for that final postseason position. A's at Tigers, Thursday at 2000 CET, live on ESPN America. I think it's important for us to you know, grow the game internationally, outside of our borders. We believe we have a great product. Um, we believe the NFL is a great, um, a great organization. So to be a part of it is very special. We want to share it with the rest of the world. We know that a lot of people uh, view uh, the Super Bowl, but we would like to have their interest the, the entire season and not just for one game. First and foremost, we have to continue to educate and promote the game uh, worldwide. But once you know, people can actually get a great understanding for it, the technicality of it, the way we scheme. Get a little depth, take it slow, and hit the tight end on the vertical. Uh, it's not just about hard hits and, and flashy touchdown dances, but it's actually some strategic behind it. And once people understand that and can get a hold of it, I think the game will take on like wildfire. I played 22 games last season, and that was two college seasons in one, you know, so uh, just the sheer number of games, the, the, the level of competition is much higher, um, the, the amount of stress that's put on you on a day-to-day -day basis to perform at a high level um, is all much higher than college. Santa Anita Bugler, Jay Cohen. You like apples? How about them apples? You like apples, don't you? Hey! Catch Sports Center seven days a week on ESPN America. Well, what to watch for tonight? Great matchup on Monday Night Football as the Broncos take on the Falcons in Atlanta. It is the first ever meeting between Peyton Manning and Matt Ryan. 8.30 Eastern on ESPN. You can also view the Watch ESPN app. And don't forget Monday Night Countdown gets it started at 6.30 Eastern. So what to make of what to expect tonight? Time for DirecTV Team Report, and we say hello to Lisa Salters. Lisa, Peyton Manning universally praised after his comeback last Sunday in the big win that the Broncos had over the Steelers. What is Peyton saying about where his game is right now? Well, Troy, he certainly looked like his old self uh, against the Steelers, but if you say 
even anywhere around Peyton Manning, hey, you're back, it's sure to get him to cringe. He told me, I have not said that. It was a good week one win, he said, but I put it in perspective. We still have a lot of work to do. Manning told me that he doesn't really compare himself now to his Colts years because he says they're just different for so many reasons. He said new players, of course, a new offense, and there's that neck injury. He says, I'm still rehabbing. Speaking of that injury, I asked him how his body felt after the game last week, and he said, look, there are obviously some things that I have to deal with between me and my body, between me and the trainer. He said it did somewhat feel like opening games in the past, but I definitely needed that day off to recover. I asked his head coach, John Fox, how he thought Peyton looked uh, in week one. He said, look, a year ago he was in the hospital just getting out of surgery. So I think what he did, what he's done so far, is remarkable. Trey? All right, Lisa, thanks. It's going to be a fun game. And let us go next level. Peyton Manning and Matt Ryan handled the heat extremely well in week one as both posted nearly identical numbers when facing at least five rushers. Manning threw for more yards in those situations, but 70 of them came after the catch of Demarius Thomas on that long touchdown. Merrill, Peyton's right. It's a different situation. It's a different era. Obviously, it's a different team. But one thing we've noticed week one, game one into Peyton Manning's stay in Denver, they're sure running that know how to offense that they ran a lot of those years in Indianapolis. Yeah, and, and the reason that they do it, you know, Peyton Manning just wants to try to get a simple look from the defense, then call the best play for his offense so his players can play fast and really watching them in the no huddle last week when he got and I'd love to play for Peyton Manning because when he gets seven in the box the runner is going to get it no Sean Marino's the back in the backfield Peyton Manning identifies two deep safeties basically seven in the box based on what his study tells him they're going to stay like that so guess what no Sean I'm going to give you the ball no Sean presses the hole into the end zone touchdown now this play is very interesting Jacob Tammy is in the slot here he had never been in the slot out of this formation but because of the no huddle, they were getting this type of look. They put Tammy there so he could block. That was a little wrinkle that actually Peyton Manning added as he got to see how the Steelers were handling his no huddle. And we have a seal here and a seal. And we have an alley in the passing game, my brothers. That's a canal. Yeah, that That's is a canal. canal. Canyon, so that alley. is part of what Peyton Manning does. Is he also goes, wait, what are they doing? How are they going to match up to me? What kind of defenses are they going to run? And if they're going to run A, B, or C, then I'm going to counter with A, B, and C. Okay, well, one thing Peyton Manning is going to have advantage of here, Brent Grimes, the great cornerback, who always mm -hmm. seems to find the ball for the Falcons out for the year. But how do the cornerbacks for the Denver Broncos match up against this suddenly resurgent and explosive Falcons passing game? Yeah, this, this to me is the, the key matchup in this football game. We all know about Champ Bailey. We saw Tracy Porter a week ago be phenomenal against the Pittsburgh Steelers. You're going to see here as he comes down into coverage there, the safety's going to come down, safety in the middle of the field. That's Tracy Porter on Mike Wallace. Now, Ben Roethlisberger puts the ball up there for Wallace to make a play on it. And look at Tracy Porter, not panic. Trust his technique. He sees a little bit of trail technique on Mike Wallace, but locates the football rather than grabbing the wide receiver and have a penalty, getting his hand in there. He, he can't play it better than that. So really impressive play there. And then here we saw this one. Ben a little late on the throw as he scans the defense. Tracy Porter right there on Emmanuel Sanders, able to undercut the route, picks it off, and runs it back for a touchdown. So now that was a very talented group of wide receivers for the Pittsburgh Steelers. But look at the Atlanta Falcons. Here's Julio Jones on the bottom of the screen against a much lesser corner, but watch him have his way with them. That's ridiculous. Down on the goal line, getting that type of separation. Easy throw from Matt Ryan. Now watch guys like Harry Douglas. They're not afraid to mix it up. Throws on him on the go screen, then gets back up and gets another block. This is a vicious group of wide receivers. You throw Harry Douglas in the mix, Julio Jones, Roddy White, a great challenge for that Atlanta Falcons wide receiver group, but also a challenge for that Bronco secondary. Yeah, and then again, let's throw in Tony Gonzalez over the middle if you Not try bad. to take away all those wide receivers. A lot of options. Two things to worry about, though. Matt Ryan at home in regular season games, 26 and 4. One of those four against the Denver Broncos in 2008, and he's never won on Monday Night Football. 0 and 3, Matt Ryan is, but all of those losses coming to the New Orleans Saints. When we continue here on NFL Primetime, lots more coming your way. The Cardinals did something they haven't done in over 20 years, stunning the Patriots, and what to make of a perfect Sunday for the NFC West. Monday Night Football, live on ESPN America. Week two kicks off in Atlanta, where the Falcons look to get their home season off to a flying start. Touchdown, Atlanta! But can veteran Manning lead the charge for the new look Broncos? Are you kidding? Denver touchdown! 
It all starts tonight at midnight 30 CET with Monday Night Countdown. Monday Night Football, live on ESPN America, home of the NFL. We have a vision for the player. We have a role for the player. He brings so much more to the table. My number one job is to just go in there and find a way to make this team a little bit better. Design quarterback, keep right guard. Tebow's inside the five. Tim Tebow, touchdown. For us to run an effective Wildcat is not a pipe dream. What we've become is a diverse, more dynamic offense. I think we'll take it to another level uh, this year. Ever since I was a little boy, I needed to climb the wall. And I didn't know about ropes. And that's what climbing means to me now, is can I climb the wall with nothing? Right now, we're in Yosemite Valley. I've been living here since the early 90s. Every climber always wants to come to Yosemite. The Lost Arrow Spire for the last 25 years has been where big steps in highlining have taken place. Welcome back to NFL Primetime, presented by Bud Light. The Patriots at the Cardinals. Tom Tupa Mohani had a great first half. Here he finds good old Ernie Jones across the middle for a nice game. Tom Tupa across the middle to Ricky Pro Shampoo. He washes out the Patriots secondary for a 67-yard touchdown. Only 26,000 close relatives watch the Cardinals beat the Patriots 24 to 10. Well, that, of course, a tribute to our 25 years of prime time. That, of course, was the call by Chris Berman. The last time the Cardinals beat the Patriots, 1991. Of course, this uh, Sunday, they were in Foxborough, where Tom Brady almost never loses a home start. Almost never loses a home start. And it was a home opener. They hadn't lost a home opener since 2001, New England hadn't. Of course, that year they did win their first Super Bowl. Kevin Cobb in for John Skelton. Third quarter, Cardinals trail the Patriots 9-6. It's a field goal fest until Andre Roberts goes in. Cobb 15-27, 140 yards, one rushing, one passing touchdown. Cardinals defense, Tim, really strong. Yeah, unbelievable. As you see there, they hit it. Daryl Washington puts on Ridley. And watch how this thing plays out. The guys up front doing work. There's Bonnie Holiday taking two, which lets Washington play downhill. And watch him meet Ridley in the backfield. This is a physical, fast group the Arizona Cardinals have. Now watch Darnell Dockett get some penetration. That's playing on the other side of the line of scrimmage. They were constantly on the other side of the scrimmage. And Merrill, it just, it, no matter well, what the it. Patriots tried. Yeah, they did it with different personnel. Just two down linemen, four linebackers, five defensive backs. They usually have three down linemen, but they removed one of the big guys, played more with a defensive back. Therefore, they had better athletes. Linebacker on tight end, sack on Brady. The personnel grouping helped them get after Brady and even helped them in the run game. All right, listen, this was theirs to salt away until this play late. Ryan Williams, the ball comes out. It's a fumble. They get it inside the Cardinals 35. Williams can't believe it. So 58 seconds to play. Danny Woodhead. Danny Woodhead finds room, and it's a touchdown. Oh, let's go to the owner's box. Robert Kraft is happy. Is that Tommy Hilfiger? Tommy, Hilfiger. Tommy Hilfiger's happy. Tommy Hilfiger and Robert Kraft no longer happy. Holding on Rob Gronkowski. Right call, wrong call. Perfect. I don't like it. It's the right call. I don't like it. All right. So Steven Goskowski, by the way, comes in to win the game. Oh. oh. He had made 38 straight fourth quarter field goals before Shank Apotamus. It goes left. What just happened? Ryan Williams off the hook. 
Patriots lose to the Cardinals. Big win for Arizona. All right, Dallas last played, I believe, in July. So they went up to <laughs> Seattle to take on the Seahawks. This was their first trip since, of course, the infamous wild card game for Tony Romo. Not only did he not get the snap down, but then he almost got the first oh. down and a touchdown. I mean, look, you only hit one more half yard. It was their first. You okay. Yeah, yeah, right. It was their first <laughs> time back. Let's just say they did not start strong. Opening kickoff, Felix Jones. Woo! There goes the ball. And it's recovered by Earl Thomas. Seahawks get a field goal out of it. Next Cowboys possession. Chris Jones back to punt. No. That's blocked. And Jerron Johnson recovers it for a touchdown. What do you think the special teams meeting is going to be like this week for the Dallas Cowboys? Which one? Seattle's or Dallas? So, Dallas. <laughs> They'll be a little long. Because I want to okay. be in Seattle's. I, I would agree with you. Uh, I think everything oh. would be in Seattle's favor in this game. Tony Romo, bad throw. Uh, intercepted by Brandon Browner. Romo was 23 of 40, 251 yards. Did have a touchdown, but an interception. Okay, 13 to 7 it was in the second half, third quarter, and they just basically said, Marshawn Lynch, take us home. And Merrill, he did. In beast mode, my brother. Great job of pressing the hole. We didn't see a seal here and a seal there because it is a beast alley. It was everything. Wait, weren't the Cowboys rested? Wasn't that the yeah. thing? Yeah, they yeah, were supposed yeah, to be sharp. <laughs> they, were, they were flat. As bad it's a long soda. It's a long Russell long. Wilson to Anthony McCoy. Zoom! 22 yard touchdown. Seahawks absolutely hammered the Cowboys. Physically beat them up 27 7. Okay, NFC West, 2 0. What about RG3 with that great debut in St. Louis for the home opener for the Rams? First quarter, 7 3 skins. Play fake, and yeah, good luck. Nice. RG3 in 14 3. Second quarter, we've seen the running game. How about the passing game? First of all, great play design. Can you hand it down there any better? No, and, Han Hankerson. and Hankerson almost well, drops he did it. Almost drop also, it. you love the, the the ball handling in the backfield by RG3. It's been one of the things that I thought his adjustment to the NFL would he'd struggle with it. He's been fantastic. He's been phenomenal. And all hail the St. Louis Amendolas. Danny Amendola is going to be a fantasy stud in this offense, especially in a PPR league. I think he might have gotten you a million points. Somebody might own him. No, not me. I don't. I, I had him last year, and then he got hurt. Uh, all over the place, 56 yards there, and then why not pay it off with a touchdown? He tied an NFL record, 12 grabs in the first half. He finished with 15 catches for 160 yards and one TD. But with all of that, the game came down to this. Rams, Redskins, two minutes left. It is... A three-point game. They're almost in field goal range. And Josh Morgan makes two mistakes here. If he goes right, he picks up a first down. Instead, he goes left. And then he does this. What are you thinking? That's a 15-yard penalty. It's the knucklehead award of the week and it cost him a game. Times two. So they had to try a 62-yard field goal. Not even close. Rams beat the Redskins. 31 to 28, but do not blame RG3. He's just the third quarterback since the merger to have at least three touchdown passes and two rushing touchdowns in his first two NFL games. The other to do it, the pride of Bro Bridge, Louisiana, Jake DeLome, who did it with the Saints, and of course, Cam, 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 Cam Newton in 2011. Okay, so the NFC West 3 0 heading into the Sunday night showdown between the Lions and the Niners. Wow, look at that, just a little handshake. What are they talking about? Great to What's see the you. big deal? Safe. Can you believe everybody's making a big deal of that? Yes. Everybody is. Oh, by the way, the Niners play big boy defense. You yeah. think? Big boy. We Listen. should make a big deal out of this. Look at Deshaun Golston it, from the half field safety position coming to making a play just two yards in the line, past the line of scrimmage. And look at this here. Stopping gonna, him again. You're going to bring pressure. Your safety's got to be able to tackle one on one situations. There's Dante Whitner making a tackle before the first down. That's what they do better than anybody. Sure do. They don't go for big hits or kill shots. They wrap them up. They, they tackle, wrap them up. They tackle them and they bring them down. The most sound team in the NFL and from blocking and tackling. And then they can do that as well. Intercepted by Goldston, and then Frank Gore was the hammer, Merrill. Well, you talk about blocking. They have all different ways to attack you. But look at this trap. Boy, you get up to the second level. You got seal here. You got a seal there. And we've got an Aleph for Gore, who hits it hard and fast. And they keep it with the bend back. A beautiful job of starting to the right. I love this run that they do because it gets the defense to flow. Look at when they start to the right, they flow. Now the backside gets cut off. Now the fullback and tailback have to work together back to the other side, and we have another Canale for Gore. Uh, the only thing the Niners did wrong, they had a turnover. First time in seven regular season oh, games they, they turned the ball over. What's wrong with San Francisco? 
when we continue what's wrong in New Orleans and how right could the Carolina Panthers be by the time this season is done. Plus a tale of two offenses in Pittsburgh. Steelers up. Jets looking like the summer squad we saw. Thursday Night Football live on ESPN America. The world champion Giants face their first road trip as the young pretender awaits. Can Eli use all his experience and get Cruz dancing once more? Or will the Panthers claw their way to victory under Newton's guidance? Giants and Panthers, Thursday at 0200 CET, live on ESPN America. Winning is not a sometime thing. It's an all the time thing. You don't win once in a while, and you don't do things right once in a while. You do them right all the time. Winning is a habit. Vinny could go from here up to blind rage in 10 seconds and then back down. There was nothing in between. And once when we were doing a piece about the dressing room and the lights went out, he screamed at us to get out, and then he realized that our electrician with his power pack light was providing the only light in the dressing room. And he suddenly smiled and invited us to drinks. There's no room for second place. There's only one place, and that's first place. I finished second twice in my time. And I don't ever want to finish second again. It's been said that reinvention is the art of redefining. To not be like your predecessors. To not be like anyone but you. Period. Much has been discussed about the state of affairs of our game of professional basketball. Its supposed heirs. The constant comparisons to its past. And the chosen ones who step into the limelight. Fair enough. But the truth is that the game of basketball consists of dimensions that stretch far beyond the realm of the hardwood, boundaries only a special few witness. You see, none of the rules have the capacity to explain mysteries like the hot hand, the art of the no-look pass, the magic of the buzzer beat, the unbelievable pressure on the perfect player. Welcome back to Primetime. I'm Lisa Salters in Atlanta with a team report. Peyton Manning's new center with the Broncos, J.D. Walton. I asked Walton how demanding Manning can be. He said, put it this way, we watch film of our walkthroughs. Even our code words have code words. And when it's just us players in the room, he said, Manning takes control of our offensive meetings. I asked him how long it took for everyone to get on the same page, and he said, it's a continuing process because they're making changes from week to week. He said, we'll be making changes tonight on the sidelines. But we're getting a better understanding, he said, of what he expects from us as far as protection and what we expect from him. Now back to primetime. Primetime rolls on with the Saints on the road taking on Carolina Panthers home opener. Cam Newton, of course, trying to make a statement early. And Tim, they made a statement once again with how they use Cam. You're exactly right. You see it set up in an empty formation. Usually they work the bubble screen, but watch the adjustment off it because they have a favorable box count here. You're going to run the power out of empty with Cam Newton as the ball carrier. So when this ball snapped, he's going to fake the go screen up top. To set up the footwork, the guard pulls around, seals it, and that's a first down. That's a well-designed play for Cam Newton. And they continued this theme, really trying to catch the Saints off guard. You're exactly right. It's about numbers now. You see three over two, essentially. And so what happens is you flip it out again. You have a hat on a hat. And this is an early down play. It's an easy completion for Cam. Rather than putting a lot on him in the passing game, a way to get it there. And then the zone read. We saw it from RG3 right here. Reading the defensive end, Will Smith, it freezes him. And that leads to a big run. That's your quarterback helping you in the run game as well as the passing game. And then, of course, when you get to the goal line, this is where Cam really shines. Second goal from the five, there's no way that's being stopped. Newton, 324 total yards and two touchdowns. As for Drew Brees, boy, he struggled in this game. This is the one Drew Brees never makes this throw. Late, running away from him. That's an easy one for Charles Godfrey. Pick six for nine yards. Fourth quarter third and four now and this may be the play of the game 
as they're trying to get back into this thing. What a nice play there to break up that pass by Chris Gamble. And then under a minute to play, Breeze looking for Graham, and this time it's picked off by John Beeson. Breeze 325 yards, but two interceptions. They're now 0-2 as the Panthers win it 35-27. And here's what you need to look at. The Saints rank at or near the bottom in a lot of defensive categories through two games. They've already surrendered 922 yards, a league high and the second highest total in franchise history through the first two games of a season. All right, this much we know so far when you look at the Saints, besides those numbers. In two straight games, they've fallen behind, had a furious rally to make it close, and come up short. And yes, we're focusing on the defensive numbers here, but that offense has not been in rhythm either, and that is what Sean Payton did as the head coach and de facto offensive coordinator and play caller. How much do they miss his presence? Well, I think they miss him a lot, much like any team would miss their head coach if they had a talented head coach. Uh, and you see it on the offensive side of the ball. I'll take it a step further, and this may rub people the wrong way. They miss Greg Williams, period. That defense was well coached by Greg Williams. They were aggressive. They created turnovers. That was a good group under him. And not that they don't have guys on their staff that can coach the defense side of the ball, but they're not playing as well. And the reality is that the changes at top between head coach and defense coordinator have hurt that football team already. We do focus on what the impact of a coach is on Sunday, you know, at 1 o'clock or 4 o'clock. But really, a head coach has an impact throughout the entire week. There was a team I was on in 1989. We were 0-2. Everybody thought we were the laughing stock of the NFL. No way could we make the playoffs. We may not even win another game. And our meeting on Tuesday, we were sitting there, we have doubting ourselves. And Chuck Noll walked in, he said, listen, I know how, what you're thinking of yourself, and I've heard what everybody said about you. But I want you to understand one thing. I believe in you. The second I heard, I believe in you, from our head coach, Chuck Noll, I was like, okay, that gave me hope. Then he created this plan. He said, listen, this is what we got to do. And then he led us through that. Now, we made the playoffs. We almost get to the AFC Championship game. So it can be done. It can turn around. But the significance of a coach throughout the week is so important, and they don't have that. Yeah. So I think it's very hard for the Saints to turn this around without somebody like that. Well, he, he was such a presence and provided so much structure, not like you said, not only in calling the plays, but during the week. And right now it's week three, and it's a must-win game for the Saints as they take on Kansas City, who would also really like to avoid going 0-3. Two disappointing teams to start this season. Jets after the big win week one in Pittsburgh. Todd Haley in the offense trying to get things going after the loss Sunday night in Denver. Third quarter, Steelers leading 13 to 10. Ben does what he does. He avoids the rush. And are you kidding me with this Mike Wallace catch? Listen, are you kidding? Listen, Trey, great catch, but we got to realize this only happens only because of Ben. He thinks he's picked up. They should be picked up. They had a hat on a hat. They don't do it. Now watch Ben. This is teaching tape. Climbing in the pocket, two hands on the football, ripping through contact, and then that's 45 yards in the air to give his receiver a chance to make a play on it. Cannot be done any better than that. Well, yeah, again, for all this new offense, bottom line, when they need to make a play, Ben run around there and make a play. But boy, did they grind it out in the fourth quarter. Third and one, Isaac Redmond for a first down. Later, it's third and four. Roethlisberger to Heath Miller eventually as he runs away from traffic here. And quite honestly, this was their best defense. Yeah. The Jets could not get on the field. Yeah. And there's a little holding call that didn't help them because it looked like there might be a possibility there, but you think? Yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit. But you know, you never know these days what they're going to call, well, what they're not going to call. Pass interference has been very oh. inconsistent. By the way, great play there as Antonio Brown also hangs on to make the catch. Here's another third down. By the way, on the season, Ben, 19 to 25 on third down, over 250 yards, three touchdowns. That's ridiculous. He is off the charts good on third down. And then eventually, Isaac, that's a tough run. That's a them big, backs, tough what, run. Their running game, both backs. You want to get Mendenhall back, a one, two, three punch? Woo! That's what Mike Tom was just saying. Woo! Woo! Yeah, baby! 27 to 10. Okay, it took a long time for Peyton Manning to get his first win in Indianapolis. Uh, Colts trying to get their first for Andrew Luck early. Second quarter, 111 left in the half. Colts with their own 36. Kobe Flynn. Listen, crucial drives at the end of the half here. Great experience for Andrew Luck. And the, cal the calmness, the poise on this drive, very impressive. Reggie Wayne there for a gain of nine. Later on the drive, third and three. Luck to Reggie Wayne. What a perfect throw. What a perfect throw. Colts lead 17 to six at the end of the half. Although it did get tight, fourth quarter game tied at 20. Bikes look like they might start their season with two straight overtime games, but no, Andrew Luck had other ideas. Roll to his left and, oh, dingo, baby. Yeah. 
Donnie Avery for a gain of 20 yards. First and 10, Luck again, this time to Reggie Wayne for a gain of 20. And Adam Vinatieri, the old man can still do it. Bang! From 53 yards away, the Colts win at 23-20. Luck 20 of 31, 224 yards and two touchdowns. When we continue on this edition of Primetime, game changers on the ground. How about those running backs, Merrill? Big Tech. Right, same time tomorrow, right? Whew, boy, this guy's a lifesaver in this LA traffic when I'm running late. Breaking ball, fly ball, left field, Snyder, long run, what a catch! Oh my! Travis Snyder says, you know what? I don't want to go back to the minor leagues, and he is playing like it. He takes away extra bases and saves a run for Henderson Alvarez. That ball was slicing away from him. We've seen him make three diving catches since he's rejoined this ball club. That's a highlight play. Now to left center field, Casilla retreating. Makes a nice running and then diving catch. Makes a nice catch right there. That first reaction going back, picking up the ball, and then his momentum making him dive, making a great catch. Because of Jackie, my dad. He admired Jackie Robinson the way he came up to the big leagues. All the situations he went through, and then he told my mom, I want, I want to put my son that name. She didn't want that name. He ended up convincing my mom. And uh, but I would say it's a good thing, you know. He was a second base, I'm a second base. He wore 42, I wore 24. I mean, there's a lot of things like, you know, I like to help people. He do the same thing, and I mean, it's, it's really weird. So, for me, it's more than I don't know the guy, his name. He was the one that opened the doors for us. How good is the game now? You got people from all over the world. After the week of football is over, check out Greeny and Golick replay the most big plays, biggest moments. Mike and Mike's Best of the NFL, Tuesday, 3 o'clock on ESPN. All right, we're going to go down Merrill Hodges just right into the heart of what he cares about, running backs. That's right. And we'll start with Reg here. Reggie Bush. A juke there. I'm going to say thick tie knots. No, <laughs> no, 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 no not, not what he loves to do in his spare time. And an athletic ability there, Reggie Bush. How about this, Reggie Bush here, a 65-yard touchdown. He now is the only mm. back in Miami Dolphins history with two rushing touchdowns of 65 yards or more. 26 carries, 172 yards. Good to have him on your fantasy team. Yes, I had him. Dolphins win 35-13. How about C.J. Spiller? Fred Jackson out there trying to rebound. Spiller was phenomenal. Takes the handoff here. 17 yards, essentially untouched until the very end. Builds up 7-0. He wasn't done. Takes this one on a toss. 15 carries, 123 yards, two touchdowns. Bills roll the Chiefs 35-17. Trent Richardson, you know, he was called out this week, and he said, I'll let my place do my talking. Oh, did he talk? Richardson, juke, see ya, gone, thank you. 32 yards, cut it to 14-10, to and then not only can he do it running, how about these moves? receiving. Well, I'll tell you this, I was at his pro day and I actually I was blown away with him as a receiver. In fact, he told me I actually wanted to be a wide receiver. I just wasn't tall enough. Well, he's good enough there. Two touchdowns in the loss, though. The Bengals get the win 34-27. When we continue, life is just a fantasy. Fantasy studs and duds ahead on Primetime. You are watching NFL Primetime. Presented by Bud Light. Thursday Night Baseball, live on ESPN America. The fight for the postseason is on. The A's can still clinch a spot in October, but Fairlander and the Tigers are hot on their heels with that final postseason position. 
A's at Tigers, Thursday at 2000 CET, live on ESPN America. Just a brilliant, brilliant year for Maurice Jones Drew in his third year as a starter. You don't hit him with one guy. You've got to hit him with two or three. How did that knee not touch the ground? That's unbelievable. I mean, he used his left arm as a tripod. Maurice is at the 45, the 50, makes a man miss. There he goes for the 45 and the 40. And pulled down at the 35-yard line. And that's a 40-yard run by Maurice. That's a huge play. You can't stop him, folks. You just can't do it. Did you hear John Madden there? Boof. Boof. Number 10, LSU versus Alabama. Mays is uh, in the quarterback and takes a snap. Now he drops back and wants to throw and throws it towards the end zone. Has a man wide open and he has got it at the uh, one yard. Oh, it's picked off. It is picked off. It was intended for Williams, but Reed came up with a football at the goal line. LSU versus Alabama, game of the century. Eric Reed makes the play of the game of the century. Alabama driving and they try a trick play. And Marquise Mays fakes a handoff, and he's got a tight end wide open running down the sidelines. And when I'm watching the play live, I'm thinking, that's it. This is a touchdown, and it's ball game. Alabama's going to find a way to win this game at home. They're going to be the number one ranked team and go undefeated. This has been a great back and forth contest. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes safety Eric Reed into the screen. And I'm thinking, OK, he's going to jump up. He may have a chance to bat this ball down. He may try to make a tackle once this tight end's made the catch. Instead, he goes up, and he actually fights the tight end for the football, high points it over top of the tight end, and somehow has the strength to wrestle the football out of his hands, gets down right at the one-yard line. Game-saving play by Eric Reed. Remarkable defensive effort. And I think that's the play. If LSU points back, the reason why they won that game is because Eric Reed made that remarkable interception. Welcome back to Primetime. I'm Lisa Salters in Atlanta with a team report. With a regular season record of 44 wins and 19 losses as a starter, Matt Ryan joins Joe Flacco and Dan Marino as the only quarterbacks in league history to have 40 wins in their first four seasons. Ryan says it's good company to be in, but he knows there's another record that people are looking at, 0-3. That's Ryan's record in the postseason. Ryan told me, I know quarterbacks are judged on what they do in the playoffs, but at this point in the year, he said, it's not what I'm worried about. Ryan did gain seven pounds of muscle this offseason with the playoffs in mind. He says he believes getting bigger and stronger will make him more durable come December and January. Now back to primetime. Primetime continues. Time for our fantasy studs and duds segment. Each of us looked over all the games that were played on Sunday and even going back to Thursday, and you could pick your best player mm -hmm. and the guy you thought that really disappointed. So we'll start studs, and don't get excited, but we're starting with you here. Yeah, because I am a stud, yeah, and so is RG3. This guy's been correct. a beast. Led all quarterbacks in fantasy points this week, and he was only started in about 50% of ESPN.com fantasy leagues. That's ridiculous. Through the air, running the football, RG3 has been an absolute fantasy beast and fantasy stud. We'll see how much longer he can continue this streak of touchdowns and rushing touchdowns. Merrill, what about you? My stud is Reggie Bush. He said, I'm going to rush for 2,000 yards, and what not a great way. Three receptions, 25 yards, 172 yards on the ground, two touchdowns. Those are big time fantasy points. A total of 31. 31. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I would agree with you, and I was very happy to see that for reasons already explained. Uh, but all hail the St. Louis Amendolas. I mean, this was a guy who was set to have a big year last year, then went down early on with that horrible, horrible injury. He is back. He wears number 16. He came up one shy of matching his jersey number. He had a game. fumble early in the game. Yeah. He bounce back. I think that they decided it was still a good idea to go to him. Tied an NFL record, 20 points, uh, by the way, fantasy points wise. And then there's the other end of the spectrum, the fantasy duds. Tim. Oh, you should start with Merrill on this, but I'll take Merrill? it anyway. Yeah, here we go. My dud. Oh, I see what you Darren did. McFadden, you see what I did? You yeah. picked up on it. Yeah. Darren McFadden didn't pick up on that. Three fantasy points for McFadden. Listen, when he's healthy, you think that he's going to get you 20 points each and every week. Fantasy dub for me, McFadden. Well, mine is Chris Johnson. Too many times I've watched him, even last year and this year, he jumps in, in and out of the hole. He's trying to hit a home run. When you do that, you usually lose yards. Get your two or three yards, and eventually that big run will come. But a dud right now. He had one more rushing yard than 
two more than Amendola had reception. Wow. I mean, he, this is coming off a four yard performance week one. Uh, I'm going with Joe Flacco. People say, what? Well, look, he was brilliant week one. Absolutely phenomenal. Only nine fantasy points. He had a touchdown and an interception. It just wasn't the same Joe Flacco we saw week one. You could also make a case of Tom Brady. You know, at the half, he was negative one fantasy point mm -hmm. uh, in that contest. Uh, obviously, Rob Gronkowski got a touchdown, but he hasn't been the dominant factor we've seen nope. either in fantasy this year. When we continue on NFL primetime, if you missed a score on Sunday, don't worry about it. We got you covered. Literally. We'll explain. Sunday Night Football Triple Header live on ESPN America. Conferences collide as the Bengals touch down in the Capitol to face RG3 and the Skins in their home opener. Then the AFC takes over as the Texans running game arrives at the Mile High City to battle Peyton and the Broncos. And we end with a red-hot rivalry as Brady leads his Pats into Baltimore to square up to the Ravens. It all starts at 1600 CET with Sunday NFL Countdown. Sunday Night Football live on ESPN America, home of the NFL. It's nice to get there and to play in that atmosphere because it's the um, every play there was a lot of stress, every play there was a lot of expectation, every play made a big impact on the outcome of the game. So to play there, to be there, to experience it, so if I do get back there again, I'll have a more calm sense about myself and I can play at a higher level. So he was he was my idol growing up, and, and I wanted to be like him one day. You know, he was uh, I admired the guy a lot, and, and and he you know he was a great motivation for me. He had a long way to go to, to do something like he did in this game, but uh, he's definitely the the greatest Mexican player of all time. The Cardinals are world champs in 2011. Being the only Mexican you know guy from Mexico to start two games in a World Series now, you know that's that's awesome. It's great. As soon as we won the game, you feel so proud of your teammates. You know, you just like, I, I, thank, I, I was thanking God. I'm like, God, thanks for giving me a chance to play with this guy. And definitely something that I'm, I'm never going to forget in my life. NFL Primetime is presented by Bud Light the official beer sponsor of the NFL. Here we go. And in part by Burger King and new crispy popcorn chicken. Limited time only at participating restaurants. Hey, make sure you join Susie Calber, Chris Mortensen, and our NFL analysts and guests, ESPN's latest unscripted show, NFL 32, as they discuss the biggest topics of the day from all 32 NFL teams. NFL 32, each weeknight, 6 Eastern on ESPN. PN2. We love doing this show because we get to break down things and show you why they happened instead of what just happened. But we also know people like to see the scores. So with that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, our gift to you and a recurring theme all season long, every single touchdown scored week two in the NFL. See ya. Here's the snap. Oh, it's a fake. And they shovel it ahead. And here comes Corkley to the end zone for the first touchdown. To Rodgers, pump fakes once, has time, throws oh, it over the middle, good go. touchdown, and a dagger! Jay Cutler, with time, lost the middle of the field, the middle of the end zone, touchdown, Kellen Davis. Adam starts from his own 19, runs up wow. the middle of the field to the 30, Here he's he to the 35, Here still running, to the 50, cuts back, to the 35, oh, makes oh. a man miss, he's going to take it to the house, 81 yards. Just as easy as that. He throws, touchdown, Dwayne Allen. Give us to the up back, Monte Leach, he's got room, and he's in, touchdown, touchdown, Raiders. Hands the ball off to Foster with a cutback, walks into the end zone, touchdown, he is so good. There's a pass downfield intended for Vince Jackson, he makes the cut, touchdown, Tampa Bay, C.J. Spiller, touchdown, takes it into the end zone, Adriel. 
Jeremiah Green. There he goes. Touchdown, Trent Richardson. Roll, tide, roll. Firing far sideline. End zone caught. Touchdown. The screen pass left side. Stewart caught. Touchdown. Doug Martin spins. Bob's weak. Goes to the left side. To the 5 3 2 1. Doug Martin. He's got his first career touchdown. Looks left into the end zone for Chandler. He's got him. Here's the handoff to Ben Tate, looking for room up the middle, looking to power his way to the end zone. Touchdown, Houston. And he throws it right. He's got Nick to the 10 to the 5. Touchdown, Giants. Touchdown, Reggie. Oh, my gosh. Right on the button to Reggie Wayne. Picked off by Eric Wright. Got a convoy. Touchdown, Tampa Bay. Dive for the pylon. Yeah. Touchdown, Bengals. Angela Williams left side. Got a touchdown. Carolina fires to the left. It's caught, and it's a touchdown for Andre Roberts. And off to Reggie Brick, tackle after tackle, another, and in the end zone. Touchdown, Reggie Bush. Touchdown! On the ball, trying to kill him, he's that one. Maurice Jones just going to the end zone. Touchdown, Jacksonville. Touchdown, Stevie Johnson. Touchdown, Reggie oh. Bush. Oh, 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 all right. Job to Tate. He's going to get into the end zone. Touchdown. Touchdown! He juked right, he's to the five, he's to the four, he's to the two, he's in the end zone! Mark Ingram in the end zone, Cobb gets to the goal line and in, touchdown! They totally fooled the Patriots! It's caught by Andrew Hawkins, has one man to yeah. beat the ten, the five, touchdown! Oh, baby! It's all on time, touchdown Miami! Oh my God, Brian Tannehill is on fire! Touchdown! Gonna heave it downfield. He's got Cruz wide open. Makes the catch. Touchdown, Giants. Stop, stop. Get a hole. Hit. Five. Touchdown, Lamar Miller. Drew Brees. Road fight. Looking for Martellus Bennett. Who makes the catch? And it's in for the touchdown. Touchdown, Kansas City. Gronkowski caught it. He's in. Touchdown, New England. Touchdown, Kyle Rudolph. Touchdown. Mike Williams. There goes up. It's caught. Touchdown, Tampa Bay. Manning hands it off to Brown. This time he's going to dance in. Chris Jones has it blocked. Ball picked up. Touchdown, Seahawks. Vic is going to run. Vic scores. Look into the end zone. Touchdown, Dante Rosario. Caught. Touchdown, San Antonio home. Touchdown, Redskins. Goes deep. Nice route down the right side. Austin at the five. Diving to the pylon. Rivers backpedaling. Hoist it to the end zone. Touchdown, Rosario again. Touchdown, Redskins. Throws the middle. Touchdown. Touchdown. Touchdown, St. Louis Rams. Big pattern. Russell Wilson made it look so simple. Mike Wallace goes there and catches it for the Pittsburgh Steelers touchdown. Watches down the field. Receivers in wide in there. open. It's caught. Touchdown, Brandon Gibson. RG3's oh, second touchdown rushing of the game. It's just going to bounce it off the left side. He goes in. Touchdown, Seahawks. Would you believe Dante Rosario again? Triple it up for number 88. Fires to the back of the end zone. Caught by Matt Mulligan. Touchdown. Second effort, spinning into the end zone is Isaac Griffin. Caught touchdown, Vernon Davis. Score hand on left side, touchdown, 49ers. Touchdown, Detroit Lions, Brandon Pettigrew. He's going to boot right, going to throw it out of the black, caught by Davis. Touchdown, 49ers. still have a lot of questions on defense. They gave up a franchise record 494 points last season, and they were last in the league against a run. New defensive coordinator Bill Sheridan didn't get a lot of new pieces to work with. Lions free agent quarterback Eric Wright is the only real veteran addition. He allows Rondy Barber to move to safety. First-round pick Mark Barron is also at safety. And at middle linebacker, they're still very young. Mason Foster, who struggled as a rookie, and Levante David, a second-round pick from Nebraska, most likely will start at weak side linebacker. But the success of the defense will rise or fall based on whether defensive tackles Gerald McCoy and Brian Price can stay healthy and make an impact. Both have been big disappointments. Each have only played about 20 games the last two seasons and have combined for seven sacks. For McCoy and Price, it's time to stop feeling the pressure and start applying it.
Week two storylines in the NFL. Steven Goskowski, no, he misses a field goal allowing the Arizona Cardinals to win. He had made 38 straight fourth quarter field goals. For the second straight week, the Eagles turned it over at least four times and won by a single point. Sure. In knocking off the Browns and Ravens, the Eagles are 2-0 for the first time since 2004. The Saints are the exact opposite. They're 0-2. They've allowed 75 points and 922 yards. Only Kansas City has allowed that many points, and they're the next opponent for the Saints. Another handshake incident after the game. Tom Coughlin, a spot cross, a tad miffed, a bit irked at Greg Schiano of the Bucks for what they did at the end of that game. We'll discuss it. And a great Monday night matchup. Peyton Manning and the Broncos take on Matt Ryan and the Falcons. Both teams pretty good week one. And with that, we welcome you into this edition of NFL Live. As always, glad you are here with us on a Monday. Trey Wingo here with Tim Hasselbeck and the coach, Eric Mangini. Uh, the Saints, two games in. Looking for any kind of good news they can find. Did they get some on Monday after a second straight loss to start the season? Saints linebacker Jonathan Vilba met with NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell at roughly 2 o'clock this afternoon at the NFL's headquarters in New York City. At issue is what happens now that the year-long suspension of Vilma by the commissioner was overturned by the appeals panel 10 days ago. As for what happened and what will happen, the words of Ed Werder. With his Saints teammates searching for solutions to their 0-2 start without suspended coach Sean Payton, linebacker Jonathan Vilma with lawyer Peter Ginsburg is pursuing his own victory through today's meeting here at the league office with NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell, whom the player is suing for defamation of character. In a text message last week, Vilma told me he wants a fair hearing, saying, we can all benefit from transparency regarding evidence and witnesses instead of using conjecture or hearsay to come to inaccurate conclusions. Expectations for Vilma and Goodell to reach a resolution today are extremely low, according to sources. The meetings with Goodell could be a tactic for Vilma to prompt a ruling from federal court judge Helen Berrigan in New Orleans. She's requested settlement discussions and asked the CBA appeals process be completed. Vilma apparently believes he has a momentum following the reinstatement and the fact that Berrigan's declared in court her inclination to rule for Vilma once the CBA process is exhausted and she's comfortable with having jurisdiction. In New York, I'm Ed Werder, ESPN. Ed, as always, thank you. Meanwhile, what to watch for tonight. Great matchup in Atlanta. Broncos play the Falcons. First ever meeting between Peyton Manning and Matt Ryan. You can catch it at 8.30 Eastern on ESPN, also on the Watch ESPN app. And don't forget, it all gets started with Monday Night Countdown served by Applebee's at 6.30 Eastern. A big part of that process will be our commander-in-chief of our NFL coverage, Bill Polian. He joins us now on NFL Live from Atlanta. All right, Bill, you drafted Peyton all those many years ago at Indianapolis. You saw how he played week one against the Pittsburgh Steelers. What's your take on where he is on, on the getting back to being Peyton Manning scale? Well, I think he's there. Uh, the only thing we need to see uh, tonight is uh, how well he can drive the ball against two really good cover corners, Dante Robinson and Asante Samuel, who are very used to playing against him. So the only thing left to see is that pinpoint accuracy against really tight cover.